please welcome Greg to the stage. We're here talking at uh, the Hemp and Health uh, Expo. Um, hemp has always been very close to my uh, heart. I've smoked cannabis for many years in a younger day, uh, used cannabis when I was a young bloke at university, thought that cannabis would be legalised, as we did in with the stupidity of youth uh, in the 70s. But um, what happened was uh, Australia and the world ratcheted up the prohibition of cannabis and by default other drugs and what ran along with that uh, worldwide prohibition was stigma, persecution and of course prosecution for the courts. We still live with today the legacy of people that have a small cannabis bust uh, from, from their uh, younger years uh, and uh, 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 persecuted and, and given limited access to travel and perhaps job opportunities because of that transgression. So uh, I guess I looked around about 10 years ago at uh, the state of the uh, uh, drug policies in the world and I was just horrified, horrified by the fact that, uh, that we, we had dogs uh, sniffing kids' groins, the truth be known, for a small bit of cannabis or, or, or other drugs. Um, and this seemed to be accepted in the Australian society. Um, the uh, degree with which uh, the prohibition has increased in severity and implications in terms of social cost, personal cost over the last 30 years uh, motivated me to get involved in the electoral process, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction there, by forming a political party in uh, 2013 election called uh, Drug Law Reform. It was unashamedly putting the case uh, in the political uh, debate in, through the election process uh, that the prohibition of drugs is counterproductive and is uh, hurting people, good people, families, our sons, our daughters uh, and, 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 and our brothers and sisters. Um, the political party, and I won't dwell on this because this is just context and backstory, I, I have a political background, uh, I was involved in the Australian Democrats with my father Don Chip that founded the Australian Democrats, so I had a little bit of a background and how to form a political party and uh, we, in the space of uh, five weeks, registered 700 members of our drug law reform party. And interestingly enough, this was also an interesting age, an innocent age with Facebook. Our ad, what they call is clickbait today, was a picture of a cannabis leaf and a rolled up joint, big fat joint if I could use that expression with a little bit of enthusiasm still from my younger days uh, as, a, as, a, as a, a, a pot enthusiast. And we got 700 people sign up, again outraged at the uh, state of the uh, uh, prosecution, persecution of people who use cannabis. We fought the 2013 election, uh, and I won't dwell on the Results. We, we got about three quarters of a percent, which wasn't bad for a minor party from a standing start out of uh, 40 odd candidates who were, were, were accessing the, uh, the, the, the uh, red registered party standing in the Senate. Um, the party was interesting because uh, unlike the hemp party, to compare and contrast, and I love the people from the hemp party who have done a, a, a lot to pursue the, the hemp cause. But we pursued more of a suits and ties, a doctors, a lawyers, um, you know, trying to put a rational argument in the political uh, arena about how harmful the drug laws are. We did the same thing in the 2013 election, uh, sorry, 2016 election. Uh, it ran on a free cannabis ticket, um, you know, running very similar to the hemp party, running hand in hand. Uh, and again, we got about three quarters of a percent of a vote from people that were just uh, sick of the drug laws. We achieved and our only achievement in that uh, drug law reform party was to give some credibility to the debate about drugs which is all we wanted to do and in those seven or eight years we've come a long way where today to discuss and to question the validity uh, the productivity of the drug prohibition uh, has hit mainstream we've got journalists now writing about it uh, we've, we've got uh, a certain groundswell the fact that this uh, health hemp and health expo exists and has now been running for the third year is testimony to the fact that uh, drugs are no longer that uh, e evil uh, frightening um, 
uh, uh, ghosts that they once were. We're now looking at these policies rationally and saying, you know, are we doing the best thing for our families and future generations by criminalising drug use? With that in mind, four years ago, we formed a registered charity and closed down the political party, believing that, first off, I guess, hemp uh, ha has this space and is doing a great job, the, the hemp party that we know. But secondarily, that if we were really going to affect large-scale social change, we needed to have an advocacy group that was well-funded, was professionally set up, and could run a, a machine, a party machine, sorry, a, a public relations machine, uh, uh, advocacy that this country has never seen. Um, and I'll go into some of the structures if you're interested in association, charitable organisations of how we did that and set it up. But let me just say that um, there are organisations like Drug Policy Australia, registered charities in Europe, uh, England, an uh, organisation called Transform, another organisation uh, called um, uh, Drug Policy Alliance, which is really responsible for the legalisation uh, of cannabis in America. Um, and we are based on that model of raising funds from people that get, and there's no other ways to put this, I'm sorry, get the fact that the drug laws are stupid. They're ridiculous, and I know that from our supporters. We've got 4,000 people Australia-wide, and I ring them up and talk to them about uh, uh, our advocacy program, and the one thought that rings through with these people is that the drug laws are stupid. By stupid, they mean counterproductive. Do they achieve their purpose of stopping people using drugs? They do not, and I'll show some figures in a minute that will give you some facts and figures uh, about uh, how counterproductive the drug laws are, if their aim was to uh, 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 reduce drug use. If I could now just perhaps flesh out Drug Policy Australia, which is an organisation, and with the unashamed uh, purpose perhaps of spruiking some support from anybody in the audience that sees uh, you know, the good in what we're doing, uh, our um, catchphrase, if you like, is facts change minds, um, and our, our, our mission, if you like, is promoting evidence-based drug policy, human rights, and I'll come back to that, uh, and public health. Um, the catchphrase we've got there, facts change mind, is an interesting catchphrase and alludes to the fact that we promote evidence-based drug policies. But the more you delve into this issue, you'll understand that in relation to drugs and any emotional issue, religious or political, that's absolute crap. Facts don't change minds, emotions change minds. And that's key to understand with the drug issue, that this is a very emotional issue for people. They've been caught in from uh, you know, primary school, been taught at schools, taught to respect the law, taught to respect our parents, and taught the fact that the drugs are dangerous. Taught a lot of misinformation, a lot of propaganda about the drug laws. And this is what drug policy is trying to do, that's what I'm trying to do as stand up here today, is put the point, make the point that the drug laws are not working and we need a better way. Um, if I could just run through again a little bit about the structure, Drug Policy Australia was a registered tax deductible charity which was no mean feat. We had to uh, put a hundred page submission to the Australian Charities Commission who thought that a health promotion charity should just be saying don't use drugs, which we all know is silly. We had to put an objection into their objection but we were the first charity to get registered uh, and our primary purpose if it comes to it is the principal purpose of the companies are to promote the prevention and control of diseases associated with the use of psycho active substances, broad brush there, but that was put in our constitution for a reason, by way of harm minimisation approach through public education, research and advocacy. That's what we do. Um, the um, uh, 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 fact that we got registered is interesting, when anyone, anyone working in the AOD or, or, or the non-profit space is that there was a new Charities 213 Act that allows organisations to register as a charity and perform political uh, advocacy. Prior to that, under common law, a charity had to provide goods or services, feed the poor, the normal categories of charities. With a lawyer friend of mine that set up, we researched the Act in 2013, and we were first cab off the rank of one of our purposes, uh, of, of our objectives or sub-purposes in our constitution is to oppose, oppose uh, or support government policy. 
So that again is quite unique and think of us like perhaps a, a Australian um, Conservation Foundation of Drug uh, Law Reform, that uh, we are a registered charity, we do our good work towards promoting evidence, educating the public, uh, providing research, providing grants for people as uh, part of our constitution. Uh, and as I say, that particular um, a set of objectives means that we are tax deductible and that is allowing us to raise funds from the public to pursue our, our good work. Uh, and the funny thing I will say is people that get where we're coming from get how, I use this in inverted commas and I'll get back to it, how evil the drug prohibition is, how it's killing our young people, and it is killing our young people, people dying at festivals by taking a pill because they can't get a, 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 a known pill of, of, of quality and strength on the, parp on the market, nor can they test the strength of that. People dying in back alleys still uh, because they, again, are using drugs of an unknown quantity when there are better ways uh, such as been used around the world. So uh, I'll develop a little bit more of that argument later. Um, the real nutshell, if I could just say it, Drug Scholars Australia, and I say this unashamedly, and I apologise to people that are a little bit new to some of the ideas I'm putting forward here in the audience. They might be believing that medical cannabis is OK, but I'm a bit iffy on the, you know, that THC stuff that makes people stoned, or, yeah, this is all right, but you know, let's still arrest those bloody uh, uh, annoying people that use ice. Um, we are unashamed, we're just saying, and if I could stand away, let's treat the drugs as a health issue, not a criminal issue. That's all we are saying, and it's been done in Portugal to great effect, and I'll get to that. But here's the, nu the, the, the nutshell. We believe that legally enforced abstinence is unrealistic, unhealthy, counterproductive in modern Australia, which has one of the highest per capita consumption rates of illicit drugs in the world. We're Olympic bloody champions. And yet we persist with this ridiculous dogma that somehow by criminalising, by arresting people that use drugs, by making it so hard, so unpleasant that they're going to stop using them, um, is just akin to madness, doing the same thing over and over without the result that you want to achieve. Um, and I'll do some figures there from a, a government survey. We've got about two and a half million people use cannabis re regularly. Two and a half million people. Um, and, and the fact that it, 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 it's illegal makes the users of those substances purchase from the black market and purchase and consume unhealthy drugs. We want to fix that and I really, really ask for your help on Drug Policy Australia, talk to friends, talk to family. Let's prosecute this case and point out to the, the people, the general public out there, how stupid how this is. And I guess what I'm saying here is we're talking, and there's no other way to put it, about prohibition. What is prohibition? Prohibition is criminalising an action. Uh, and if I could, if there's any philosophy students or political students in the audience, the philosophy of John Stuart Mills that basically says that we have the right as individuals to put into our mind or bodies what we decide. Prohibition is a law that countermands that very sage philosophy of 17, 18 uh, central, it's liberal philosophy, the very basis of liberalism, if you like, uh, that, that, that says, no, we're going to criminalise this behaviour, we're going to stamp it out. Uh, and the, the American uh, prohibition uh, indicated what are the pitfalls, the dangers of prohibition. And we see it today in the drug prohibition, you know, massive uh, violence. Um, if you think about a prohibited uh, drug market, um, if I have a, a dispute, if I'm selling liquor for argument's sake and somebody comes in with a gun and sticks me up and uh, wants my money or my, my booze, I give it to them, I go to the police, we have processes in a civilised society, we process, those people are arrested, put in jail and convicted in the normal course of events. If I'm selling cannabis for argument's sake on a, a retail, a wholesale or whatever level, I don't have the protections of law. So what happens is, and we've had this in the gangland war, uh, we have massive murder and mayhem as a result of the prohibition, the, the black market. Uh, we've got examples in Mexico, uh, 20,000 human beings were murdered in Mexico as a product of the drug wars. 20,000 human beings, like you, you and you and you. This isn't just a mythical number, this is people with families that are shot down as drug and violence escalates due to the attempt, and here's the madness, attempt to prohibit people using drugs. So 
we as an advocacy charity put the case, and forgive me for being passionate, but I do believe this, and I, I really would like you to spread the word, and uh, I do believe most of you will be behind this, but let's rethink it, let's argue, let's be proud about what we believe in after 40 or 50 years. So the first step in this process is to legalise cannabis. Now, look, this is just a no-brainer. I made submissions, as Drug Policy Australia does, to the... Um, uh, the Victorian inquiry and other government inquiries, legalise and regulate what Drug Policy Australia is trying to do, and this is where there's some people with vested interests in this room uh, representing the industry, the hemp or the uh, medical or, or the rec potential recreational market. We want to implement rational, sensible drug laws when they come in, and you know, not the bullshit laws that we got with medical cannabis. Uh, it, it just makes me sick to have politicians over the last two and three years, Steve Brax, I don't want to be partisan about it, but crowing about what a fantastic job they've done introducing medical cannabis, how they have listened to the um, uh, voice of the people that are suffering and they've introduced it. That's rubbish. They didn't introduce medical cannabis. They placated in a political sense. They put out press releases, but the regime, as I'm sure you've heard from other speakers here, is so restrictive to really not be uh, practical to give people an access to uh, medical cannabis. So I've got one of our supporters, breaks my heart in Queensland, a mother uh, of a 16-year-old daughter with epilepsy trying to get access to uh, 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 affordable cannabis products. And apart from all the rigmarole she's going through, she can't afford it on, on her pension. So her daughter goes without. So here's the point I'm making is that Drug Policy Australia is an advocacy group. When we need to introduce legislation, we've got to make sure those laws are, are, are practical laws. They're not a prohibition point two zero, another way of you know, admitting the fact or, 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 or conceding the fact that, oh, yes, cannabis is a really dangerous, addictive drugs, drug. And therefore, when we legalise it, yeah, we'll do that begrudgingly, but we're going to make these other really harsh laws, that if you're driving with a skerrick in your system, you'll use your licence, if you're uh, selling it or, you know, Canada is an example of some laws that are a good step forward, but not a solution to the problem. And again, Drug Policy Australia would like to implement rational laws that protect kids uh, as they're protected from alcohol sales, but certainly um, be involved in the debate. And the, and, and the real thing that uh, we need in Australia is access to the ability to grow your own herbal cannabis. And I mean, seriously, let's grow some plants out the back. Four plants that have been legalised in uh, Canada is not good enough. If you've got a medical need, four plants doesn't suit it, and then you weed out your female, uh, your male plants, as you know, it's just not going to cut it. It's not access to medical cannabis. We're going to have two parallel markets. If you want my opinions on some things that have been discussed today, you'll certainly have a, a backyard home industry, which is fine, like any herb. You will have pharmaceuticals doing highly researched, refined, targeted drugs. There's room in this market for everybody, but the ability to grow a herb. And I just want to remind everybody before we, we, we move on from the cannabis point, um, cannabis is a herb, a plant. Now, I, I want you to think about when you're going to talk to your grandchildren or your children in 10 or 20 or 30 years' time, of what were you doing in the great cannabis persecution? What were you doing? And this is the way we look at history, um, and, and we've got to call this for what it is. Not only stupid and ridiculous, it's immoral to be arresting somebody for possessing a plant, I mean, you've got to go, what were they thinking? And we can delve into the conspiracy theories and some reasons for it. Richard Nixon, political, trying to perhaps uh, isolate uh, some, some political foes, the reason for it, uh, Mexico, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's just bloody stupid. A plant in your pocket, five years jail. And I just put it in those terms, you know, let's just be sensible. And if you've got to talk to people about this issue, uh, it's the way to put it. Are you serious? And they will move in with some of the, the propaganda, the misinformation, if you like. But at the end of the day, it is prohibition, attempting to prohibit, stop people using drugs that is ineffective and doesn't work. Um, and I, I've, I've mentioned about the, uh, the prohibition, what we need to end it and replace it with sensible regulation that will keep people alive, will keep people healthy and give them access to the medicine they need. 
I mentioned earlier that I'm going to talk a little bit about just some figures to scope out this problem for you if you haven't sort of delved into these government reports. Now this is a national drug survey. This is put together every three years by the government. It asks people in a survey, ultimately, do you use drugs? And that's a vexed question because a lot of people uh, don't always tell the truth about this. Certainly if I'm pulled over the side of the road by a police officer, do I? No. Uh, you know, we, we all lie to our parents that may have a prejudicial opinion of drugs. Do you use drugs? Uh, no. Uh, when you're asked by a government uh, official, even in a survey and all anonymous, do you use drugs? I put it to you that that's going to be very well under representative. So these are base figures of the people that use. So some estimates, and these are estimates done by, uh, uh, this always amuses me to be perfectly frank, uh, te testing uh, uh, sewerage to see uh, well, well, how many people are using drugs. Uh, you know, okay, there's reasons to get some health information, but you know, they're peering in our toilets, they're looking in our rubbish. You know, how far, how into our civil liberties can this prohibition uh, move? And again, just see that with a little bit of uh, an irony, if you like. But the, the sewerage reports show much higher usage than these figures done by a national survey. But nonetheless, these figures are absolutely shocking. And I, I, I'll talk about a little uh, uh, of them just to give some of the highlights, if you like. Um, the first one, I'm going to start with that top line that I've, I've shown you. Um, the rates of uh, cigarette smoking have virtually halved in about 20 years. And they haven't done that by locking up and criminalising tobacco, much as that appealed, appealed to some people. Um, they have used other mechanisms, the pricing mechanisms. They've used a very important public health tool, uh, advertising and promotion. And I just highlight that to you make the point if, you know, let's say we don't want people to use cannabis, and I think that's a reasonable proposition. It has health consequences. Uh, it, the high levels of THC can be demotivating. Uh, it depends very much on the person's uh, psychological makeup uh, and how they respond to THC. It's not for everybody. Um, but um, if it's a personal choice, there are ways to control consumption so we optimise public health. And that's a very important thing. By actually criminalising people, um, arresting them, um, is counterproductive to public health. And look, I, I just get so many stories about the harms of prohibition. I've got a, and I'll diverge just to tell you a, a, a quick story. Uh, uh, it had a 20-year-old at our stand who was busted uh, with a gram in his pocket. Not a lot, not a big deal. But he was in tears because he didn't want his parents to find out. They found out. Uh, he had a criminal record. He was going over to travel next year with his mates. He had a whole bunch of implications for Graham. Now, again, truth be known, he'll probably get off with a suspended sentence and no conviction recorded. But he wasn't aware of that. That's one example, and I might talk some others. Um, but the point is that if we do want to control cannabis use, which I think is a respectable thing, we don't want to be promoting it as, you know, this is the best thing, it's an individual choice, good for some, not, not so much for others. I will say, of course, much better than alcohol. If we legalised cannabis and more people used alcohol, that would be a fantastic move for social health. Think about it, less domestic violence, less psoriasis of the liver, uh, less drunken uh, accidents on the road. Um, so there would be massive benefits of legalisation, but if we do legalise, we need to promote uh, uh, sensible uh, adult use and keep it out of the hands of children. That would be done by the same approach we've taken to tobacco. Um, the marijuana cannabis figures aren't really that interesting there, uh, except that they have dropped off as a 13-point high uh, in the 2000s. Uh, I, I will say when uh, Michael Boulderstone, the, the hemp party, if you refer me, forgive me referring to you, Michael, uh, when we were smoking our dope in the 70s, uh, there was a lot higher percentage. The figures go up to about 15 or 16 per cent. Maybe we were just more honest in those days. Um, but, uh, you know, cannabis, uh, th those uh, numbers are, are, are startling. A uh, quick bit of math says that's two million people using cannabis regularly. Um, cocaine um, is another drug, a stimulant, uh, certainly has a propensional for addiction and uh, manic behaviour. But the point drug policy Australia is saying, let's not criminalise that behaviour. Uh, let's, as we do in Portugal, bring those people up to some sort of a health commission if they prove to be just casual users, having no problematic use. Well, what's the point in putting them into a, a penal system? Um, the same with MDMA. MDMA is a, is a drug. Um, the figures there, um, we've got highlighted just above the, uh, 
the, the cannabis figure there, or below the cannabis figure, uh, is again a strikingly high figure of 2.2%. That's about half a million Australians using ecstasy every weekend. Half a million young people. And it is extensively young people, more or less from uh, 20s to 30s of the main bracket there. So you might have 6 or 7% using ecstasy pills. Uh, and why, why would they do that? You may want to ask yourself if you're not very au fait with ecstasy, as I'm sure we're not a good audience of good law-abiding citizens here. Um, my answer to that is it's just bloody good fun. Pure and simple. And here's the truth about drugs that we need to admit before we can go on. Drugs are good fun. It's a fact. We do it for pleasure. We do it to feel good. Are drugs dangerous? Do they have the potential for addiction? Can we be overindulged in them like alcohol? Of course we can. And this is where a rational society will put those health measures out rather than this ridiculous Nancy Reagan war on drugs just say no rubbish. And Drug Policy Australia is just talking to adults and I believe, here's my faith in uh, common sense, that uh, in time, 10 or 20 years, the prohibition will be undone. It will come undone because it's unsustainable in an economic sense. It will come undone probably by people of, a, 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 of more of a, a, a liberal right-wing persuasion because of the economic arguments. And I don't think we've got time. We might open up for questions if we have time later, but there are massive arguments there. Um, the National Drug um, uh, Survey that we're talking about on use um, highlights the cannabis use of uh, a third of people have used uh, cannabis in their lifetime. So we're literally criminalising uh, cannabis use. Something that sticks in my craw still when I was standing for politics, the 2016 election, uh, our deposed uh, uh, Prime Minister Malcolm, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Bel uh, uh, Turnbull, um, was asked on a current affairs, have you smoked cannabis? And with a hearty belly laugh, he goes, oh, oh yes, I've smoked cannabis, and uh, yeah, well, did you want to, yes, I inhale, laugh, laugh, laugh. Now, he didn't realise what he was saying. He had committed an offence that, 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 that has ruined the lives, their ability to travel, their ability to get jobs, of tens of thousands of Australians. And they're the numbers we're talking about here. People have been arrested, and I'll get to those. And the, 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 the uh, front of a politician doing that, I, you know, we reckon Malcolm got a, a hard time in the <laughs> recent reshuffle, but that's not the point. It wasn't due to his uh, uh, confessing to drug use, it was laughed off, showing again the massive hypocrisy surrounding this issue. The, the Prime Minister can say, oh yes, I use pot, but still not put his, his name behind uh, 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 changing the laws. Um, so look, a third of the people, 10% of Australians using cannabis uh, is, uh, a million, uh, is 2 million people. Yeah, what, five minutes? Uh, we've just got five minutes, so we'll wrap this up quickly. Um, the uh, Australian Crime Commission uh, is another government survey um, which um, has got some stunning figures uh, in terms of cannabis arrests there. Uh, you can see uh, that's about 70,000 people, but the startling, the frightening, the obscene part of those figures are that the, uh, the, the, the dealer addressed, if you like, for a colloquial term, supplier addressed is going down, but consumer uh, offences is going up. Um, and uh, the, the um, numbers of offence we're talking about uh, is stunning. 77,000 Australians arrested for cannabis in 2017. Going through the legal system, paying legal costs, uh, being arrested, uh, being demeaned, 91% of those are for uh, 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 consumer-only offences, having a bag of dope. And this, again, you've got to call this for what it is, people. This is an obscenity. How ridiculous. Let's do something about it. Um, cannabis state by arrest, a little bit of a bright spot in Victoria, was a reduction of uh, 4%. But nonetheless, uh, that figure uh, in Victoria of 10,000 people arrested for cannabis. 10,000 people. I just want you to picture, as primary school, we used to you know, put your hand on the shoulder of the next person next to you for PT. Okay? Now I want you to imagine a line from here to Geelong. That is how long, uh, well, that's 70,000, I should say, 70 kilometres. Uh, from here, uh, a line 10 kilometres long of people per year waiting to get arrested. So it's an obscenity. Uh, we've dealt with the issues of uh, assumptions of cannabis prohibition, that it's dangerous, it's a gateway drug. Thank you, Greg Hunt. What an ignorant bastard. And not to be party political here, but how could he say it's a gateway theory? Those that have got a logical mind know that we all started on mother's milk. 
did mother's milk lead us to uh, be, be, become heroin addicts? No, it did not. It's a piece of false logic that's very clear to those that are prepared to think it through and face these issues with an open mind. What does uh, Drug Policy Australia do? I'm getting dirty looks here, but we will wind up. What Drug Policy Australia do uh, is uh, we go, make reports to government inquiries. Um, did, could you give me the book? Um, we uh, make submissions, and I was personally making a submission to the Victorian Drug Inquiry that we should legalise and regulate ecstasy. Now, for some people here, a bridge too far, but if you think about it, half a million young people using ecstasy of unknown strength, putting their lives in danger every weekend. What if we had a system where they went to the doctor, got their heart checked to see if they were uh, uh, medically fit, got a script, you know, I've got my honeymoon on at the weekend, they got to dish to a pill of ecstasy. Would the world come undone? Would we save some lives? And I think so. It's a, it's a future uh, point, but it's something that we need to consider as we undo the prohibition. Uh, we had an event at uh, the Town Hall recently from Johan Hari, a beautiful man. We had 800 people at the Town Hall talking about drug prohibition. It's an idea whose time has come. And I really implore you to get involved. We've got our stand over there. Uh, we're collecting donations. We're having the odd raffle. We're giving away Johan's beautiful book uh, for $22. Um, we have, uh, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner there, stands in the city to spruik our cause. But what we're doing, uh, and if you get where I'm coming from, and people that understand how evil prohibition is, how it is killing a, a generation of people or are putting them at risk, is that uh, we support our good work by monthly contributions. A small monthly contribution, $10 a month, it doesn't matter. Uh, this woman I was speaking about in Queensland, bless her heart, is chipping in $5 a month. What we're doing for the show here is giving anybody a $22 book uh, to read. All you have to do is sign up uh, for a monthly donation. Having said that, you can also do it on your phone, Drug Policy Australia. My mobile number's there, get in touch. Uh, Drug Policy Australia donation, and you can sign up for a, uh, a monthly donation. Uh, come and see me at the stand and I'll give you a copy of the book. Thank you very, very much. Greg, thank you so much. Such a passionate presentation. A lot to think about. Drug Policy Australia is a fully tax-deductible charity. If you'd like to help save our young people from the harms of prohibition, please visit the donation page on our website. Thank you.